Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we begin this session, as we begin to come before the throne of grace, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance, that he will show us that which we need to understand for this time, that he will help us to understand that which we need so that we may more clearly represent his character to those in the world around us. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we know of our sin even when sometimes we are setting it aside. We have a need of repentance. We need to face what has occurred so that we may more properly come to an understanding of that which you would have us to present before the world. As we assemble together, we ask that you join with us. We ask, Father, for your guidance and for your direction. Help us today to understand the points that are now before us as we open Judges chapter 3. Be with us, direct us, show us that which needs to be done so that we may more properly reflect your character and be guided in the path that you would have us to walk this time. For this end, Father, we pray. For your blessing, we ask that you join with us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> Yesterday we began a quick overview of Judges chapter 3. Now as we're going through this, we are being shown in Judges 3 verse 1 that these are the nations that the Lord left to prove Israel by them, even as many of Israel had not known all the wars of Canaan. What can we take from this verse? How do we take this in reference to what we're going through today? How is the movement to be proved by the people and the nations around us? Is this meaning something literal or is this something that is figurative? Well, this would definitely be figurative. And um, so this movement has around it um, false teachings. And we're being tested by those things. Okay. Whether we'll be uh, tempted to, to follow those things. And those can be lots of different types of things. They can be just simple beliefs that we have, that we've inherited. They can be the influence of the beliefs of the world, uh, the media. All these things that we can get caught up in instead of focusing upon uh, the covenant that we have with God. One is the covenant is that God is leading this movement and and we need to uh, accept the light of the midnight cry and build upon the foundation that was established at the beginning. And, and it seems pretty clear to me that this is what, what people are being tested on.
if we are setting aside the light of the midnight cry, if we are seeking our light from other sources, are we not rejecting that which God has been providing? Well, and I, and I think also what ends up happening, I mean, people may not outwardly completely reject everything. So people can say, well, we accept July 18th um, and things like that. But if we're not studying them, if we're not understanding the message that was given in the past, then, then we really have rejected it. And, and I think it's interesting, too, because, you know, I just came out with this paper on the midnight cry uh, in our study of, of basically going back and trying to figure the evidences for the midnight cry being empowered on August 15th, 1844. And one of the things we find is that there is there's errors in our understanding of the story. That is the way that the story has come to us. It's primarily through uh, Jay and Loughborough. And Loughborough wasn't there, and he's taken these different stories and get got them confused together. So he's conflated these, these different um, events, Boston and Exeter, and then created this story that has, has survived in the imagination of Seventh-day Adventists. And to me, that's the type of of the types of errors that we have existing within the movement itself. That is, we have some beliefs that are just stories we have told ourselves that really don't, don't show a correct picture. And so going back to the foundation, the thing that this movement was about, is to go back into the past and understand it correctly. Now, one of the things in my, my article, for those who've read it or been part of the discussion, is that Samuel Snow riding up on a horse, in my estimation, actually occurred at Boston, not at Exeter. And what does the horse represent? Islam. Islam. So... So to me, that there's also a, a misplacing of Islam that occurs in this story, whatever that means. So, so there are things that, that we can learn by going back on the past and correcting our understanding of things. Um, and, and maybe we could say maybe it happened both places. Maybe he showed up at Exeter on a horse, but he definitely showed up in Boston on a horse. Otherwise, he couldn't have got to Boston to to present that day. And so, so there definitely has to be, you know, there's more to the story. There's more to our understanding of things than what we had in the past. That is, we have to go back and we have to, as we've been doing, examining the foundation and gleaning these truths and, and these insights that have been missed in the past. We did that when we studied um, early writings, page 74. We noticed details, an incorrect date. Even though it's a symbolic date, it's there purposefully, right? That is in God's purpose, even though it's a mistake of man to say it's September 23rd when it's actually October 23rd that she has that vision. But September 23rd becomes a symbol, which we continue to use it doesn't mean it's a wrong symbol so so i think that's part of it is that we have these these teachings or these nations we can say it's the nations here it's symbolizing these different beliefs these different parties whatever it is that are vying for our attention and they're they're meant to be there to test us that is to develop in us a Christ-like character.
Okay. <clears throat> Judges 3, 2. Only that the generations of the children of Israel might know to teach them war. At the least, such as before, knew nothing thereof. Does this generation understand what it means to be as the children of the book? Do we understand the battles that our Millerite forefathers went through to defend the interpretations of the Bible as provided by those that use Miller's rules. And even to go back and understand Jack uh, is Levites, referring to the Levites. Well, I still think that this refers to our movement. I, I think from chapter two, this refers to the people from the history of 9 11 up until 2023. Because that, that's, the, that's the group that's being addressed. Yeah, so the, the generation, the, generation that don't understand, that don't know the history of war, or war. Yeah, which, which would be Jeff's history in this context. Okay. Because Jeff is, is, is that judge. He's also Joshua, right? He represents both of them. And so do we understand the foundation of this message? I'm having to ask if we understand it clearly at this point. Yeah. Well, that's what we have to understand. I mean, as a Seventh-day Adventist, we need to understand the foundations of Seventh-day Adventism. So that's that's first what this movement has been about. That's what Jeff's movement really was about, was unsealing the seven thunders, which is really an understanding of Millerite history. But in order to, to do what Jeff did, is this movement really understanding how we came to these truths and that is are we have we incorporated the the teachings of the nations around us into our belief system okay Now, we are given a list in Judges 3.3, namely five lords of the Philistines and all the Canaanites and all the Sidonians and the Hivites that dwell in Mount Lebanon from Mount Baal Hermon unto the entering in of Hamath. Specifically, if I'm going to pick on one point in this verse, what do we see as Baal Hermon? Well, that's actually, if Mount Hermon is, is uh, representing Paneum. Represent, well, the name means pre, uh, possessor of destruction. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, I'm looking at something different. Okay. Baal, of course, is Lord. a lord. Herman, if we're looking at Hebrew 2768, I believe it is. <clears throat> is this not the mount of the sanctuary. Um, well, this is Mount Hermon. 
Right. So that's that's where pineum is. But what what is the what is the definition of Herman? I have it as devoted. Right. As what? Devoted. Herman is devoted. Okay, that's odd. Okay. Um, uh, because Herman is is two seven six three. What do you have? I was I was seeing it two seven six eight. So, am I incorrect? Um. Yeah. Well, okay, it's related to 2768. Two, okay. But uh, 2768. Uh, two, um, and uh, they're both related. They both mean uh, abrupt. Or like a, a, prominent, a prominent mountain? Yeah. Because Herman is, is really prominent. And it's usually snow covered. So, if I'm looking at Brown Driver Briggs, Mount Hermon or Sacred Mountain? Yeah. Yeah. How would how would Father Miller have seen a mountain? What would that what would that symbol mean to him? That kingdom, our church. The church. So, in this situation, is this verse telling us that the church? has been possessed, has been taken over by doctrine that is not of God? Seem to be that way. Oh, it is that way. <laughs> this is a structure of cursed thing. Okay. Being cursed. Right. According to uh, Hitchcock's. Agreed. So in this situation, when we're dealing with this, we're basically being told that the movement is to be proved. by the symbolic nations around it. But one of those nations, one of those items that's going to prove it are the understanding that have come from Baal Herman, a sacred mountain that is possessed by others. Yeah, I don't get that interpretation. I'm, to me, Baal Hermon is just Paneum, is what it's symbolizing. Because this is Mount Hermon, which is where Paneum is. I'm not battling against Paneum. Yeah. What I am attempting and I'm being led to show yeah. is that these figurative symbols can have more than one meaning. Well, yeah, they can. But so what we have is we have, um, we have the five lords of the Philistines. So we need to understand that symbol. All of the Canaanites. So these are the, these are the nations around us. So this is symbolizing things around us that are. Revelation 7.11. Testing us, right? Okay. 
correlate with Revelation seventeen eleven? What five are fallen, one is, one yet to come. Yeah. yeah, I couldn't help thinking about that. Okay, that's interesting. And then we have the Sidonians. So the Sidonians, these are um, uh, means hunting. These are fishers. It's a place of fishing. The Canaanites themselves. These are the traders or traffickers, peddlers. And then we have the Hivites. And these are the, Wicked. the villagers. They're the what? Villagers. They're the ones who inhabit the, the, the villages of Palestine. Okay. The idea, the meaning yeah. of that. So all the different people that are sort of scattered throughout. Um, but these are the Hivites that dwelt in Mount Lebanon. Right. From Mount Baal Hermon unto the entering of Hamath. So we would need to figure out what each of these mean and what these Hivites who dwell in Mount Lebanon, who these people are, right? What, what, what error is this representing? What error are the five lords of the Philistines representing? At least that's the way I've approached it. So these are all errors, right? Okay. These are all influences that are influencing us away from the truth. I think we would have to be looking at, at these, especially these different nations. Mm -hmm. When we're looking at their errors, how were their methods of worship? Okay. I'm sure that you're going we're, that we're going to find that Molech figures prominently. I'm sure that we're going to find that Ashtaroth will figure prominently. We have here Baal Hermon. So we would have some representation of the priests of Baal. And then Hamath would be intriguing because we would have to have to look at its name because it is wall, is it not? Yeah, it's a fortress, right? Of all of the errors that are given, what is the one that is seen as being the most impenetrable from those that are around us? It's not the state of the dead. Would it be Sunday sacredness or would it be something else? Would it also, could it also be that the law has been set aside or that we are no longer under the law, we are under grace? Yeah, it could be all, all of those, all two of those go together. So there's quite a bit within this that we're going to have to unpack, that we're going to have to consider. I think it's, it's up to each of us to really take a look at this verse and look for the symbolic meanings of each of these nations well i don't think it's just about the names of them though it has to do with the beliefs systems associated with these groups agreed yeah so if i if i'm misspeaking thank you for correcting me 
I agree. It has to do with their beliefs. It has to do with their method of worship. And they were to prove Israel by them to know whether they would hearken unto the commandments of the Lord, which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. Here where we're talking about these commandments coming by the hand of Moses. We're seeing that in this book of Judges, that it is not by Moses and Joshua, it is by Moses alone. So is this, in a manner of speaking, showing that the leadership of Joshua was a repeat and enlarge of what had occurred with Moses? Is Joshua a representation of the second angel's message? Now, as we go forward, and the children of Israel dwelt among the Canaanites, the Hivites, the, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. We know that the Jebusites were the inhabitants of Jerusalem. But we're adding in, outside of the Canaanites, the Hivites, we're adding in the Hittites, and the Amorites and the Perizzites. Again, are these methods of worship, sim I mean, what, what symbolism will we draw from this? Because we're expanding on these nations from, from Judges 3.3. 3. So by Judges 3.5, we have more. Yes, we could take Apostate. a look at Ezra 9.1. Apostate Protestantism. Okay, if we were to look at Ezra 9.1, what would we find? It says, now when these things were done, the princes came to me saying, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands, doing according to their abominations, even of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. So each method of these worships that are being outlined in Ezra 9.1 were seen as being an abomination to God. Yeah, and, and this is a marriage to these nations, right? right? Which we saw the children of Israel dwelt among them. And it says they took their daughters to be their wives and gave their daughters to their sons. So this goes to that divorcement of the strange marriage in Ezra 10. Well, it goes to that. It also, it, the underlying portion is you shall not seek a league with the nations around you. Yeah. So I, th I think part of the things we'd have to ask is how have we done that? How have we sought a league with the nations around us? I mean... I mean, we could obviously getting, see getting caught up in the politics of the day right? as one way. So not only do we see this portion from Judges 3.6, 
And they took their daughters to be their wives and gave their daughters to their sons. It's also very clear. And served their gods. Yeah. Years, just a few years back, I was conversing with a friend of mine that lives in Alaska. And the comment was being made about the daughter of a conference leader in Alaska that had chosen to marry, and she chose to marry a member of the Church of Latter-day Saints. Now, I've been around enough to see some different kind of things going on. I was also very surprised when this same friend admitted that one of their friends was commenting about how the friend's husband had chosen to leave the Adventist church and become a Catholic because he found such great grace within the Catholic church. Are these not accepting the teachings and worship methods of these other churches? Is this not a description of exactly what we're seeing here in Judges 3? Well, that's definitely part of it. You have some thoughts there, Jeff? Well, I'll just say, yeah, I'll just, that's all. Yeah. Okay. Because an, another point, though, that that I think we have to consider is the influence of the so-called uh, conservative ministries upon this movement. Um, so, you know, there's people watching, um, you know, Save to Serve and, um, you know, Walter Weith and, and these types of things to get information. And, and we would also look at even everything dealing with the pandemic, the groups that are, um, you know, promoting the different theories about what's happening. I, I think this has been a danger to this movement. I think it's hugely dangerous. Now, as we continue on, Judges 3, 7, and 3, 8. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and forgot their Lord their God, and served Balaam and the groves, priests of Baal, priests of the groves. Therefore the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of Cushan, Rish Atham, king of Mesopotamia, and the children of Israel served Cushan, Rish Atham, eight years. Yeah, now, I had sent you. Uh, just a moment. Sorry, I sent you an email about that. Sorry. Okay. In, in a moment. Okay. And when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer to the children of Israel, who delivered them, even Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. And the alternate reading of deliverer is Savior. Now, from this email yesterday, I had several things that I had to consider when I returned. So, 
I'm going to share part of this email, but I'm also going to suggest that we need to look at some other items. Judges 3 9, Kushan, Rashathiam, Hebrew 3573, double wickedness. Now, in that email, as was stated, the verse that immediately came as you were providing this sister was Jeremiah 2.13. Would you like to read that, please? Okay, it says, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. How do we see that today within the movement? I just was examining my own heart, and I thought, what is there in me? That is false. What am I holding to past trauma, uh, wrong concepts, false doctrines? What is it? And I just started again to surrender it all to God. I said, you're going to have to heal me. I'm a total mess. Uh, implant your word and your character in me. And this is what we all need. Like I was very convicted when I looked up these verses. I really heard the Lord speaking to me personally. And I... You know, I commend your testimony. In this situation, we have to look at this, look at ourselves first, and then we have to look at the movement as well. We, I don't know what's in their hearts. I cannot judge, you know. Okay, but the, the point has been, we've been asking, where is the message that we are to give? How can we give a give? How, how can we give a message if we are a broken cistern that holds no water? Would yeah. you agree well, or disagree? Well, the message that we're going to be giving will be fragmented at best. Okay. Can someone else read Proverbs 20? Go ahead, Theodore. Okay, so just a couple of things here. So we're, we're looking at uh, which means double evil or two evils, right? Right. So that's, that's why we got to that verse there dealing with the, the two evils. Okay. Right. Okay. And, and we know Mesopotamia is two rivers. Right, so he's the king of Mesopotamia of these two rivers. And what do the two rivers represent in this movement? The Ulai and the and 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 the Hittikil, so the true and the false, right? Okay. Um, I mean, according to the time of the end magazine. Right. So so there's these these two rivers. Now we know that um, uh, Tess was presenting these two rivers as two streams of, of information. Now, I don't know if it was true and false, according to Time of the End magazine. I mean, it was, uh, how did that go? Um, I'll have to look it up again. Yeah. So, um, the, you align the Hittikil. We know that, that that's what's represented. But... Anyway, if we look at these two streams here in Mesopotamia, these are streams of Babylon. And, and Tess wanted us to accept the one stream and, and reject the other stream. The one stream would be MSNBC, CNN, the liberal media, and we are supposed to reject Fox. But Jeff argued that both streams are bad. I'm just going to mute, mute you there, Angela, because it's really noisy. Um, so we have these two streams, and we have these two evils. We have these two ditches. And has this movement gone into both of these ditches? Yes. 
Okay. So, so to me, that's what I get from it. Now, I know that there's uh, the, the thing that Angela is bringing out is extremely important because what we're looking at is our own hearts. Yes. So we, so we could look at other people and we could say, well, Tess and, and Parminder, they were liberals and, and Omega's liberal, right? Right. So, so we, we reject their idea that CNN and MSNBC and that is a source of light. But we're going to accept Fox. But we've just gone into the other ditch. Agreed. Yeah. And so that verse that dealt with these uh, uh, these broken cisterns, what was that verse again? Jeremiah 2.13. Okay. So Jeremiah 2.13. And so in so as we read in there, it says, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken the fountain of living waters. So that's the one. So the fountain of living waters, of course, would be the truth. And hewed out broken out cisterns, broken cisterns that can have no water. So so those are the two evils. And then we would need to understand what those represent. I mean, we can know the broken cisterns would be the system of education. That's what that's come to symbolize within Adventism. But also forsaking the fountains of living waters. Do we not find the fountain of living water is part of the testimony of God through his prophets? Mm -hmm. And, and that would also be the truth from the past, that stream that flows out from under the, the, the sanctuary, under the, um, I can't remember the word for it, the threshold of the sanctuary, right? right. And which we understood to be time, right, when we studied Ezekiel. Right. Because that, that stream, that river represented a period of time. So, from this part of the presentation, we are being shown these two evils from Jeremiah. Mm -hmm. Proverbs 28.13 reads, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Yeah, and, and this is this is where we're at, and because Angela definitely has been approaching this correctly. That is, this is not about someone else. This is about us. Right. Or more specifically, me. Now, the next reference that she'd given, John 5.40. Okay. Would you like to read that, please? Who's going to read that? You. Oh. John 540, and ye will not come to me that ye might have life. So if we, if we are unwilling to come to Christ, if we are unwilling to be have our sins removed from us, we will not have life. Yeah, and, and before that, search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Right. And ye will not come to me, that ye might have life. So for many people, we can search the Bible. We can be doing Bible study, but we don't have a revelation of Jesus Christ. I mean, it doesn't mean that God hasn't been working in our lives, but we're avoiding the light that is coming from his word. Because it says in him was life and that life was the light of men or the light really that comes to man. And then we had 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Mm -hmm. 
is this not showing righteousness by faith? Mm -hmm. So if we are unwilling to confess our sins, how can we ever become righteous by faith? Oh, we can't. Impossible. But you know how we try to, to get righteousness by faith. Yeah. Well, you know, we, we start to become particular about certain things that we can control in our lives. But we never deal with the root of the problem. Right. That is, we can be, um, you know, condemning our brother, speaking gossip and lies. We can be misrepresenting the truth. We can be deceitful. And we do it all with a clean conscience because we avoid the conviction that God brings to us through his word. And we think that we are righteous. And that's the most dangerous place to be in. Right. Because we're definitely not. So in this, as the email had continued, Concealing sin and making excuses for it when confronted is a double wickedness. The antidote is honest confession and repentance. Mm -hmm. Would we agree with that statement? Mm -hmm. Now, when we look at Judges 3.9, along with Numbers 13, 6, Joshua 15, 16 to 18, or 19, and Judges 1, 13, we would find a clarification <clears throat> that Othniel was Caleb's nephew and Kenaz was Caleb's brother. Um... I don't think that's correct. Okay. Um, but but we need to look up those verses then, because that that's a whole other point, though. Okay. What we're addressing right now, but so if we're looking at Numbers thirteen six. we have. Of the tribe of Judah, Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. Now, that could have been his father. That could have been his grandfather, right? Yeah. Okay. Joshua 15, 16 to 19. And Caleb said, he that smiteth Gurjaf Sefer and taketh it, to him will I give Aksa, my daughter, to wife. And Othniel, the son of Kenaz, the brother of Caleb, took it, and he gave him Aksa, his daughter, to wife. Yeah, so Othniel's the brother of Caleb. Othniel is the son of Kenaz. Right. Is Kenaz the brother of Caleb, or is Othniel the brother of Caleb? Othniel. Okay. He just has a different, um, well, Kenaz would be, um, I, I don't know if that's the mother or the father, but uh, that's the question that I don't know. Well, the point Stephen brought it out very clearly was that Othniel was Caleb's brother. Yeah, but it, it's just when we read it here, you know, in English, you could think Othniel's the son of Kenaz and Kenaz is the brother of Caleb, but it's referring to the book person before, Othniel. Okay. Othniel. Just, yeah. go, excuse me, Stephen, go ahead. I had the thought that maybe Kenes and Jephunneh were like uh, their fathers, but they had maybe the same mother as another 
option. Okay. But do we know who Kanaz is? Is that a man or a woman? I'm not sure. Because, I mean, sometimes they just could have a different mother. And, but, you know, I never looked into that before. Okay. Joshua 14, 6. Then the children of Judah came unto Joshua in Gilgal. And Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenazite, said unto him. So Kenaz was, the, man. was the predecessor. Yeah, so that'd be the man. Yeah. So yeah, the Ken, I'm just reading this here now, the Kenazites. So, so he's one of the sons of Eliaphaz, Kenaz, um, chief of the Edomitish tribe, Caleb's younger brother. So that's a different one, I think. Father of Othniel. Anyway, so Caleb uh, and Othniel are brothers. Okay, so Othniel, if we're considering Hebrews 6274, would mean force of God. The question or the point that was being raised is, is Othniel, is the message of Othniel the force of God or the Holy Spirit? Yeah, we had to have this discussion before. Okay. When we studied Joshua 15, so... Refresh my memory. I don't remember. Somebody needs to refresh my memory. <laughs> okay. I have a um, powerful one or lion of God for all. Yeah. yeah, I thought we had it representing Christ. But what does Christ send us? Well, his Holy Spirit. Now. The question that, that I was asking very directly, as we have been going through this brief portion of the study, as we're looking at this in the consideration with Jeremiah 2.13 and Proverbs 28.13, we do not wish to be under a double wickedness. Mm -hmm. What is the work of the Holy Spirit? Well, to convict us of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Okay, but in a 10-year period, Mrs. White wrote several portions, several items that I found fairly interesting. In 1880, she writes the following. There is great danger of encouraging a class of men to enter the field who have no genuine burden for souls. They may be able to interest the people and engage in controversy, while they are by no means men of thought, who will improve their ability and enlarge their capacities. We have a dwarfed and defective ministry. Unless Christ shall abide in the men who preach the truth, they will lower the moral and religious standard wherever they are tolerated. One example is given them, even Christ. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. All scripture, including the portion of scripture that G.I. Butler believed was not inspired. <clears throat> In the Bible, we have the unerring counsel of God. Its teachings 
practically carried out will fit man for any position of duty. It is the voice of God speaking every day to the soul. How carefully should the young study the word of God and treasure up its sentiments in the heart, that its precepts may be made to govern the whole conduct. Our young ministers and those who have been sometime preaching show a marked deficiency in their understanding of the scriptures. The work of the Holy Spirit is to enlighten the darkened understanding, to melt the selfish, stony heart to subdue the religious, tra the rebellious transgressor, and to save him from the corrupting influence of the influences of the world. The prayer of Christ for his disciples was, "Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. The sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, pierces the heart." of the sinner and cuts it in pieces. When the theory of the truth is repeated without its sacred influence being felt upon the soul of the speaker, it has no force upon the hearers, but is rejected as error, the speaker making himself responsible for the loss of the souls. We must be sure that our ministers are converted men humble, meek, and lowly of heart. In 1888, she wrote the following. It is the work of the Holy Spirit to reprove the world, to reprove the self-righteous. All this self-applause, all this flattering of self, this lip service is a false estimate of your own merits. This overrating of your poor finite work, your tainted performances, your blemished obedience is an offense to God. The Lord will permit you for a time to go on in your self-boasting. You may deceive others. Obtain the sympathy of some of your brethren and sisters. You may misconstrue, prevaricate, but the Lord, who reads the purposes of the heart, never makes a mistake. He can establish truth and righteousness directly opposite to that which now prevails. It is through unfeigned repentance alone that you can come into a right relationship with God. The Lord himself, through the convicting power of truth, can remove your blindness and mastery, master this inordinate love and esteem of yourself and subdue your stubborn prejudice. We would not for one moment favor your connection with the health retreat without special evidence of thorough conversion on your part. There are traits of character which you possess that you would not be able to work with any living man unless you were first. In order to obtain the favor and approbation of men, you would act the deceptive part. Unless the exaltation of self ceases, unless Christ is magnified, Unless your self-righteousness is cast away and you put on the righteousness of Christ, you cannot be among the overcomers. The straightforward course of integrity must be pursued by you ere Christ will take pleasure in you. Signs of the Times later that same year. Those who profess to be members of God's family and who expect to stand one day around the throne should be careful to cultivate here the spirit that will prevail in heaven. Love is the fulfilling of the law. And the love of Jesus in the heart will bind this, his church together in bonds of Christian fellowship. Like that fellowship, 
which will exist in the courts above. We have no need to err, for we possess a perfect pattern in the life of Jesus by which to fashion our life actions. And the fact that we represent him so poorly should make us humble and should lead us to exercise love and forbearance toward others who may err. Unless we do cultivate human, humility in the view of our own deficiencies, there will be developed in us an element of hard-heartedness akin to that in the character of Satan. Criticism and coldness and disunion in the church will undo the work of the Holy Spirit of God. With what we've been seeing since July 18th, this comment of Mrs. White's, this publishment of Mrs. White's is a damning testimony. The question that I have right now as we were addressing yesterday, when God chose to raise up judges, he raised up men, and those men were to give a specific message, correct or not correct? Correct. We were addressing that for our time, that the judges that are being raised up are a message. Mm -hmm. At this point, there has been a message received. Whether it has been accepted in the heart or not is the big question. But the message has been our great need of repentance. Mm -hmm. And that's what these judges are to do is to bring us to repentance. That is, these are all these messages, just like we have these nations around us. These are the messages, the doctrines that are being taught. And the judges come to deliver us from those things. But if we do not have true repentance, mm -hmm. How can it be said that we fear God? If we have no true repentance, how can we give glory to him? And how can we face the judgment that is to come? We need a work wrought in our characters, such as will fit us for the great responsibilities that Christ has laid upon us. There are souls to be saved on every side, and we need to love others as Christ has loved us. If we fulfill our obligations to our fellow men, those who indulge in a spirit of jealousy, who are constantly inclined to think evil and to judge the motives of others, are not possessors of the love of Christ, nor fitted for his holy service. Those that choose to say, oh, all you're doing is criticizing, are not possessors of the love of Christ. For those that would wish to condemn what is now being said, I suggest you take this up with the prophet. October 30th, 1889. Wednesday morning, attended the early morning meeting. The room was full. I was pleased to see so great an interest manifested. 
I spoke in regard to the necessity of our ministers being fitted up day by day with the baptism of the Holy Ghost before going forth to their labors. Christ has promised it. Why should they not have it? Lay hold by faith. Many precious testimonies have, have borne, but yet there is not that fullness of faith that reaches out for a fullness of the blessing of God, as it is our privilege and our duty to have. I fear many will go away from this meeting greatly in need of the very blessings that is their privilege to receive just now, and notwithstanding the most precious light given upon the importance of thorough sanctification through the truth, that they will not walk in the light, but be wandering in darkness because they are not doers of the word. Truth must be practiced if we increase in knowledge. Then we shall not, when some strong temptation comes, be overcome by the enemy. Please recall, these words are written a year after the meeting in Minneapolis. We may all gain a deep and rich experience here if we will seek for it with all our hearts, humbling ourselves under the mighty hand of God and letting God, not we ourselves, do the lifting of us up. Christ in the heart is the death blow to all our self-love, selfishness and covetousness, which is idolatry. Lead a man to wish to be his own savior and to trust proudly in his own human finite cap capability and merits for salvation. They will fail him every day if he does this and be to him eternal loss hereafter. He will be like the blind leading the blind. Both will fall into the ditch. The work of the Holy Spirit on the, on the heart is to break down and expel this self-love. This lofty approval of self and this accusing spirit. The soul temple must be emptied and cleansed from its moral defilement that Jesus may find room to abide in the soul as an honored guest, that he, the pure, true witness, may be the power exercised in a holy life. Then Christ is revealed in the heart by faith and precious victories are gained. Christ should never be out of the mind. The angel said concerning him, thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Jesus, precious Savior, assurance, helpfulness, security, and peace are all in him. He is the dispeller of all of our doubts, the earnest of all of our hopes. How precious is the thought that we may indeed become partakers of the divine nature, whereby we may overcome as Christ overcame. Jesus is the fullness of our expectation. He is the melody of our songs, the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. He is living water to the thirsty soul. He is our refuge in the storm. He is our righteousness, our sanctification, our redemption. When Christ is our personal Savior, we shall show forth the praises of him who hath called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. This great spiritual destitution is not caused by any failure on the part of Christ doing all that is possible for the church. Our Heavenly Father bestowed all heaven in one gift, that of his dear Son. The work of the Holy Spirit is not to daub with untempered mortar, but is to convince the world of sin of righteousness, of judgment to come. 
Is this not the message of the angels of Revelation 14 and the other angel of Revelation 18? Mm -hmm. Without repentance, how are we to understand sin? Without the understanding of sin, how are we to understand that which is righteousness, true righteousness? And without true righteousness, how are we to stand before the mercy seat in judgment? Each of these are taking us step by step through the sanctuary. Mrs. White is very clear. She is showing us what has been going on. She is showing us what we have accepted from the nations around us. She is showing us what is permeating our experience with Christ. So my question remains, is this message, the message of Othniel, the first judge, is it not proper that it be a message of repentance? Mm -hmm. And that's been the message that God's been giving us. But how many of us, myself included, have accepted this message completely and truly? Well, since God's giving us this message, I mean, I would think that maybe none of us. And I mean, this is where we have to start. Right. Because it's the only thing that's going to uh, to help us in this in this test. I mean, it's the first step of that test. Are we actually going to be converted by the things we're studying? Are we going to take it to heart and make it part of us? Yes, and I have to add, we have to do that day by day. I know I have to do it day by day because there's so many distractions. And as I said, I am a total mess. I really need Jesus. Well, from the email, I felt that it was very important that a lot of these things be shared throughout this time today and as i was led to look upon this there were words that were being impressed upon my mind through my day yesterday one of the things that i was doing i've been preparing equipment for it to be sold i was having to clean the equipment because everything that i had was not clean when you come to the end of the day, after you have been cleaning and cleaning and cleaning, when you've had your hands in what began as clear water, and it became murky, and it became brown, it became dark, it became smelly, you want to get rid of that at the end of the day. But what do you find in the bottom? of the vessel that you use that once contained clear water. You find, you find all sorts of soil. Yeah. Is this not a representation 
of the sins that we have all chosen to hold on to. Yep. We are, we are left with a situation right now. Only Christ can truly cleanse us. There is nothing that we can do in and of ourselves that is going to cleanse us from the sin that we have chosen in our own lives. Each of us are going to need to accept the fact that there is nothing good in any of us. No, not one. This is a day by day, or is it even better said, minute by minute and hour by hour work to have these things removed from our lives. We don't have need of politics. We don't have need of CNN, of Fox, of any of the rest of this. Our need is to be our need of Christ. Because if we're going to be be able to pass the time that's ahead. If one is, I mean, we have to be able to give a message. And, and we know that we, we haven't been converted enough to give a message that's going to convert others. And, and that we weren't ready to, to do the work that God had asked us to do. But God has given us all kinds of light. And, and yet, we've been distracted. You know, we've, we've gotten caught up in what's happening in the world, emotionally caught up. And I'm, I'm saying every one of us to some degree or other, whether, you know, just the things that have happened with the pandemic, which of course we know are not of God. But the question is, how does that make us feel? Where do our sentiments lie? Is, is our recognition that something is wrong sufficient in and of itself to prepare us for, to stand on the side of truth, or do we need something to happen inside of us so that we can stand on the side of truth? I mean, for instance, with the truckers, it's easy to feel sympathy with those that are opposing um, tyrannical governments but that's not going to be enough to help us to stand in the testing time we could still end up on the wrong side of the issue because if we haven't addressed the sin problem in our lives and not not the sins problem not the little things that we we have control over but the things that are deep with inside us that only Christ can remedy. There's some little things we don't have control of either. <laughs> well, yeah, but there are little things that we can have control over that, that sometimes yeah. can fool us into thinking that we're converted. You know, Ellen White, in, I believe it's in five testimonies, um, uh, but it could be wrong. It could be in four testimonies where uh, she talks about the message to the Laodiceans and and in there, I believe it's in this, this one article, but it, it could be somewhere else. Uh, but she talks about Christ knocking on the door of the heart and that we need to remove the rubbish from in front of the door so that he can enter in to cleanse the heart. But sometimes we can think that we can rearrange this rubbish, you know, sweep it off into a corner somewhere. 
but we still have this rubbish in front of the door because we don't want Christ to come in. We don't want him to see what we're really like. And it's that kind of conversion that actually has to occur, where Christ is inside of us. I know these are all just kind of illustrations, right, that we, we use, but they can be very, very helpful to recognize the situation we're in presently. I would agree. No, illustrations are helpful. Yeah. So, all of this, the email yesterday, and this, this was only part of the email, all of this gave a very pointed instruction as to what is necessary. We've been asking, we've been asking questions. How can we come into unity? And I think it's very direct that we cannot come into unity without repentance. Mm -hmm. The repentance needs to be personal before it can be corporate. So at this point, the question is, is the message of Othniel an instruction from God through his Holy Spirit? Well, it has to be. If it has to be, then would we be foolish to set it aside as did the children of Israel? We definitely can't set it aside. Agreed. Any other thoughts? Any other comment? Yes, I'd like to share briefly. There's a book that I'm reading, Principles to Ponder by Theodore, I guess, Karchitz or something. And he says, grudge bearing is a mean and subtle form of egotism. People often go through life nursing hurt feelings, little realizing that they are pampering a bad case of selfishness. How easily people are peeved, offended, irritated, provoked, or incensed, even while engaged in church work. A grudging and resentful spirit soon gains full control of the individual who harbors the idea that he is not being used right, that he has been wronged, that somebody wants to harm him, and that he is not appreciated by his fellow man as he should be. Lacking forbearance and patience, it is easy for one to store up criticism, slights, insults, ingratitude, and wrongs to the point that serenity, poise, and peace of mind are crowded out of the life. He that hateth his brother is in darkness, 1 John 2.11. I think it is. Bitterness over some real or fancied wrong has caused men and women to stop praying, reading the Bible, paying tithe, and fellowshipping with believers on the Sabbath day. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? First John 4, 20. And as I'm reading this, I'm thinking, that's my nature, boy. I'm the most grudge-bearing, uh, vindictive, uh, self-pitying individual when I'm in in the natural and now i'm having to deal with all kinds of conflict in my family the backbiting and the horrible slurs and refusing to help people that need to be helped and i'm thinking wow 
<laughs> that's in their DNA. Lord, help me to be a clean vessel so I can finally start getting through to these people. Like it's such a burden on my heart. And I think I'll, if I can't even reach my own family, how am I going to reach the world? You know? So I'm going through it right now. And I'm thankful for the refining fires and all this ex expose and all this confession to you, brethren, because we really need to examine our own hearts and just go on with God and forget about every, I mean, not totally forget about, but go on without being so affected that we're actually obstructed for carrying on whatever mission the Lord has for us. Thank you. Anything else? We have come to the close of our time today. Shall we now thank our Heavenly Father for this message? and for the consideration that we need to give to this message in order to truly become unified. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, as we have read these passages and we have read the word of your prophet, We thank you for the blessings that you have given. We thank you for the message that has been presented. And thank you for the messenger that you have provided in the past to show us that we need repentance or we will not see the kingdom to come. Guide us now, Father. Show us that, that you would have us to understand. May your character be that which is shown to all today. May your will be done in our lives. Cleanse us. Prepare us. Help us. For we need you. We need your spirit so that we may more properly emulate the character of Christ, which is your character. Direct us to this end. I thank you for each that have been at this meeting today and each that have participated. Be with us as we go forward. For this, we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.